Good morning. Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. We lift up our souls to you, holy God. We trust the Lord with our past, present, and future. Guide our every move, holy one. That we may walk in your paths of love and mercy. Let us worship the one who leads us in what is right. Together, Together let us worship God. Our opening hymn is number 63, The Lord is God. <clears throat> trust in him, we dare to approach God with confidence. Please join me in the prayer of confession. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By the hope we have done, and by the hope we have left undone, we have not loved you with our whole heart, and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbor as our chances. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, how close to them that we are, and direct what we shall be, that we may walk in your grace to the glory of your name. Amen. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you, God. God. So again, I will be speaking to the grown-up children. <laughs> and it is a joy. I come thinking I'm going to teach this little one to raise them. And how often we have forgotten what they already knew. And more or less, our task as grown-ups may be to keep seeing, keep learning from them so they can hold on and grow what they know without losing maybe as much as we have. So today I was going to ask about neighborhood. And neighbors, um, I have no idea how neighborhood boundary works in Hemet Springs Valley. Um, in Japan, in Tokyo, I'm Tokyo centric. Um, and I grew up in Tokyo. I only, only knew Tokyo 
And when I came out to the States, I met other people from other parts of Japan. And that showed me how, when I said, in Japan, and they would say, you mean in Tokyo. <laughs> and, uh, it's a relevant point because in Japanese we have this saying that defines neighbors. It's three houses cross your street and your direct right and left. That was that was pretty much the definition of neighbors. Um, that does not mean we we don't have a community. We are very uh, oh okay. <laughs> I'm going to let the children in. <laughs> <laughs> and here are our teachers this morning. Come on in. So good to have you. <laughs> Thank you. Do you have a seat right here with me? Right here, baby. Yeah. <laughs> we were just talking about what we can learn from you two today. Can you tell us, do you know the word neighbor? Do you have a neighbor? Uh, I have one. You do? And you have, who's your neighbors? Well, we're going to be talking about neighbors. And I was just telling the grown ups here, like where I come from in Japan or in Tokyo, <laughs> when we say neighbor, because we are so crowded, we live in a very crowded city. So when we think about neighbors, there's like three people across from our house and two people. Um, but I remember I live in a complex that one building has 50 houses. So, right? So we're going to be talking about neighbors. So please join me in praying. Yes, God, we thank you for your children with their fresh eyes and ears. We are able to hear your word with our fresh eyes and ears. Hold us together in this hour of worship as we search in the Holy Scripture what you have to say to us today. Amen. Thank you for joining us. A prayer for illumination. Testify to us, O oh God, by the voice of your spirit. Put your law Write your word in our minds and show your will in our lives through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Our reading this morning from the Hebrew scripture is from Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 to 14. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. Surely, this commandment that I am commanding you today is not too hard for you, nor is it too far away. It is not in heaven that you should say, who will go up to heaven for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. Neither is it beyond the sea that you should say, who will cross to the other side of the sea for us and get it for us so that we may hear it and observe it. No, the word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart for you to observe. And the reading from the New Testament today is from the Gospel of Luke. Chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Now we are traveling together with Luke, who is, shown, who is following Jesus on his travel towards Jerusalem. 
Just then, a lawyer stood up and to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? He answered, you shall love the Lord, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will live. But wanting to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road. And when he saw him, he passed away by the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him and he saw him. He was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell, in, fell into the hands of the robbers? The lawyer said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Word of the Lord. So for those of you who are there, I've been here just over one month. And since I've been given this privilege to preach from the pulpit of this church, standing in the middle of this diverse community, I have been sensing something like, something like a concern in the air that somehow my preaching might be based on something other than the word of God in scripture or whatever that comes out of my mouth might be telling what to do, how to live your life, like how to vote. And I can't understand that concern, especially now when it feels like in our country that there are major collisions in every direction at the crossroad of the law of the land on one hand and the lives of the people on the other hand. People of faith through the ages have turned to the scriptures as authoritative standard of faith and life. And still today, we turn to the Bible to guide us through life and teach us how to live. My task as a preacher, as a teaching elder, which is another word for pastor, is to preach the gospel in the fidelity, in the fidelity to the scripture, which means faithful to the scripture and dependence upon the Holy Spirit. And this is why we say the prayer for illumination before we hear the scripture read. So as we search the scripture for God's desire for us today, we turn to one great teacher, Jesus, and teach us how to live. What do I need to do? That's the, exactly the question Jesus was asked in the gospel reading for this morning. 
And many of us are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan, even though it is found only in the Gospel of Luke. But we may not have noticed when we think about this parable that it is a part of Jesus' answer to his question from the lawyer, a legal expert, expert on Torah, the law of Moses. The lawyer asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Not as a sincere inquiry, but to test Jesus. He is challenging Jesus' authority, even as he calls Jesus teacher. There must have been tension between how this guy interpreted the law of Moses as an expert and what he had seen Jesus teach in the crowds as a popular but uncredential Galilean. Asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? which is to belong to the kingdom of God. Jesus says, what does the law say? And the lawyer responds with what we have come to know as the summary of the law. Love the Lord your God and love your neighbor as yourself. Right, says Jesus, do that and you'll be fine. But wanting to justify himself, the lawyer pushes back with yet another question. Well, who is my neighbor? Apparently, in the lawyer's mind, this term neighbor needs a definition so that he can justify himself in loving some people that comes in the definition while not loving other people and still inherit eternal life. Well, Jesus, where do you draw the boundary of neighborhood? The lawyer appeared to be saying. So this parable of the Samaritan zeroes in on this very point. So this love your neighbor as yourself imperative comes from the book of Leviticus, part of the law of Moses. In that context, the neighbor meant one's fellow Israelites. And in the same chapter, a few commandments later, he also says, the alien who resides with you shall be to you as the native born among you. You shall love the alien, the foreign born as yourself. So even though as a neighbor was understood as your fellow Israelite, he was a part of a series of other expanding commandments. But here, the lawyer is focused on that one. I go back to the parable. You may have already heard that the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, the man was traveling, was a notoriously dangerous road. Dangerous in the sense of physical makeup of it. It was uh, like 70 miles, but it dropped like some 3,000 feet, or something like that. And it was like, it had a narrow end and perfect place for robbers to hide and attack people. So that was the road he was going. And there's a lot of other details that I shared with my students at middle school, which we were not going today. A lot of details we may not be aware, like it says, you know, traveling down from Jerusalem, because one always went up to Jerusalem, right? Because the place of the importance. So people coming down from Jerusalem most likely have done whatever the way to worship or business was on the way back. Anyway, as luck would have it, the man, supposedly a Jew, fell victim to a brutal attack. And you know what happens. The first person who came down that road and saw the poor man lying half dead was a priest. And he passed by on the other side. Then came a Levi. And that's a temple assistant. And he too passed by on the other side. Now, we can speculate all we want based on these details that may not be apparent to us, but it was apparent for the original uh, audience that Luke was writing to, that there are possible realistic reasons that why, uh, why they did not 
stop, but just passed by. Maybe they thought he was already dead. And touching the blood, let alone a dead body, would make these religious responsible people unclean, preventing them from doing their duties. Or maybe they thought the victim was a trap in this popular, notorious road. And if you try to go over there, you may become a victim. We're not told why. All we know is whatever the reasons, the reasons only served to prevent them from taking any action. Then comes the Samaritan. As, as you may know, the relationship with, between the Samaritans and the Jews in the time of Jesus was deeply strained. So when we read Samaritan elsewhere in the parables, we know the people that represented there is the other, the people that your people did not mix with. So this Samaritan traveler who had his own business to tend to, see the injured man and is moved by compassion which moves him into action. And not just a nice gesture, but an act of kindness into which he puts all his heart and soul and strength and mind. You heard the details. Now, if the third passerby had been another Jew, the morale of the story would have been simply a neighbor is whoever shows mercy to those in need. And that is true enough. And in fact, that's what the lawyer answers when Jesus asked which of these three was a neighbor to the man. The lawyer almost cannot bring himself to say, it's the Samaritans. The Samaritan showed mercy, yes, but in doing so, he broke free of the social and religious boundary that was separating them. And it was the depth and the strength of his compassion that empowered him to take action, act in love. And that made all the difference. Whether the lawyer acknowledges or not, it is this Samaritan whose example Jesus is telling him to follow, go and do likewise. In the end, Ones who would inherit earth eternal life, the ones who live in the kingdom of God are not defined by any worldly conditional status of who they are, but by their capacity for compassion that moves them into loving action. In God's eyes, you are what you do. The parable is a story of those on one hand who are held back by their own sense of who they are and who the person in need is. And on the other hand, the one whose compassion overruled all such worldly notions. With this parable, Jesus does not simply remove the boundary delimiting who my neighbor is. Rather, he stretches it he redraws re re the boundary to include especially the people who we don't think are deserving of a compassion. In this parable, set in Jewish culture in Jesus' time, that worldly judgment, that notion that got in the way, was a hostility based on ethno-religious identity. But it could be anything. What boundary do we draw that betrays a secret bias, hidden bias, invisible even to us, about who is and who is not deserving of our compassion? I was asked to teach seventh grade ethics class this last spring, my last uh, semester of middle school. I told the school that if they wanted me to teach it, it would have to be ethics of Jesus. And it will be all about the close reading of his parables. The parable of the Good Samaritan was one we spent a lot of time on. 
the students learned about the historical setting and who those characters were. And because of who those characters were, the meaning that they brought to that shaped the story. Then they did a, a reader's theater in chapel. But the surprise came when I asked them to write their own version, their own modern day version of this parable in their own life setting. One student wrote this. It's all in his own words, used with permission. One morning, there was a man who was taking drugs and he took so much that he passed out on the sidewalk. A man who was taking a walk passed, him, passed by him without even stopping to check if he was okay. A policeman then who was on, off duty walked by and didn't care because he wasn't on duty. Then a person who was in a rush for work stopped and helped the man who drove him to the hospital. What struck me about this student's version of the parable is this. Unlike the victim of the robbery in Jesus' story, who was a victim of some external evil acts, this man passing out on the sidewalk was his own doing. Nowadays, we have a better understanding of addiction as disease, but our society is not very sympathetic to those who are suffering the consequences of their own choices. We let our judgment of such people get in the way of becoming compassionate. God helps those who help themselves, many say. Mistakenly thinking it's in the Bible. According to the research by a Christian demographer and pollster, George Berna, and I'm quoting, the belief that this is, this is a phrase that occurs in the Bible, or is even one of the Ten Commandments, is common in the United States. Despite not appearing in the Bible, this phrase topped a poll of the most widely known Bible verses. Ethics refers to moral principles, that govern a person's behavior or the conduct, conducting of an activity. It concerns how we live our lives. The commandment to love God with all that we are and to love our neighbors as ourselves sets in motion this circle of love that starts with the first and the great commandment with the emphasis to loving God and obeying God's will, which is to do God's will, which leads to the second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves, which activates our compassion for our neighbor, which moves us into loving action, which circles back to loving God. Because Jesus said, loving neighbor is like loving God. Loving neighbor is the only way we can feel what it's like to love God. And with the call, to practice this ethics of the circle of love is now. It is the law of the land in the kingdom of God. And Jesus' parables show us what living in that kingdom with the law of the land, that is the circle of love, ethics looks like. As we find ourselves at the crossroad of faith and doubt, conviction and question, in the real life living of our days. May we continue to turn to the scriptures for guidance with the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit in the community of faith that all may inherit eternal life. Sing together theme number 343. Now, if you look, sing with the words on the projector, nothing to worry about. If, if you are singing from the hymn, we are uh, singing verses one, three, four, six. We are skipping 25 because it's very long. But if you go by the screen, you don't need to worry about it. Okay. 
Let us stand and sing. teaching, if it were to be lived through me, my life will look like. And that is one thing that you would not hear me telling you from the pulpit. But action is central somehow. We continue to see what that action that is we are called to take. And when you become a member of a congregation in Presbyterian Church, by virtue of the connectional nature of a concrete uh, denomination, you become part of the church that is happening throughout this country. And as a church, just as we individually discern what is mine to do, the church as a body of Christ living in this time and space are continuously discerning what is ours to do. And from time to time, we feel moved by the spirit to make it known to the world, our intention, our commitment to God. And that is collected in the book, which is a second part of uh, the first part of the constitution of this denomination. It has many confessions, uh, which is the fruit of the process that I just described to you. So today, I would like to invite all of us to join our voices in reading an expert excerpt from Confession of 1967. Let us join our voices in reading a affirmation of faith. In each time and place. Thank you. There we go. In each time and place, there were particular problems and crises through which God called the church to act. The life, death, resurrection, and promised coming of Jesus Christ has set a pattern for the church's mission. His human life involves the church in the common life of all people. He serviced the men and women. 
commits the church to work for every form of human well-being. If suffering makes the church sensitive to all human suffering, so that it sees the face of Christ in the basis of persons in every kind of need, in the power of the risen Christ and the hope of each other, the church sees the cross of God's renewal of human life in society and of God's victory over all wrongs. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. Let us return to God the offerings of our life and the gifts of the earth. <laughs> Merciful and gracious God, from your open hand, we all have received much. Accept this offering of your people, remembering your love, those who have brought it. Remember also those persons and purposes for which it is given. So follow this sacrifice with your blessing, that it may promote peace and goodwill and advance the reign of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. So as we approach God in our prayer, may it be our act of love for the world. I will begin this people's prayer and there'll be a moment where we invite those who have joys and concerns to share, are invited to lift up the prayer. And after each sharing of joys and concerns, the congregation together say, Lord, hear our prayer. Let us pray. God, our creator, we praise you and give thanks for the boundless love you have for us. You made all things in your wisdom, and in your love, you save us. You have taught us through Christ that love fulfills the law. Lord, you have called us to serve you. Grant that we may minister in your name. 
with your love in our hearts, your truth in our minds, your strength in our wills. Hear now our prayers as we lift them up to you from one neighbor for another. What? We have one from chat. Healing prayers for Tucker Dyer. Lord, Lord hear prayers. It's Susanna's. Oh, Susanna. Um, I just like to ask a special prayer for the young man. He's such an important part of this church for so long and I require She has a great sense of humor and her wonderful community. So when you say that she's in hospice, it's hard to hear. She, I'm sure she needs our love. Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. Well, first I have to make a confession. My husband can't hear that when he gives his prayer. My brother is um, 10 years older than I am, so I'm Seemingly not so bad stroke. Very, very good. He's now moving into an assisted living person. So that he did not have a good relationship with him. Oh. Lord, Lord, hear our prayers. Your brain is absolutely wonderful. Thank you, Lord. Lord, 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 Lord
Thank you. 